All right. Well, thank you all so much for joining us for Living with Wildlife in Massachusetts with the Mass Audubon. We share Massachusetts with a diverse range of wildlife that you may have come across exploring your neighborhood or uh, maybe making headlines in the news. I know that uh, we've had some uh, black bears uh, roaming around Tewksbury and uh, the Merrimack Valley over the last uh, month or so. Uh, we're going to learn about commonly encountered wildlife, such as deer, coyote, and raccoons, and their intersection with the wild and developed spaces that we inhabit. We're going to find out best practices for maintaining bird feeders and attracting visitors. From amazing pollinators to problematic mosquitoes and ticks, we'll introduce some incredible insects and how we impact uh, each other. And whether you watch it from your window or from your screens, you'll learn more about how to peacefully coexist with these unique neighbors here in the Commonwealth. And so today's class is led by Tia Apinney, who's a biologist, lead naturalist, and educator at Mass Audubon's Drumlin Farm Wildlife Sanctuary in Lincoln. Since 1994, when she first started working at the farm, Tia has overseen efforts to maintain New England's wildlife on the 206 acre property managing staff and volunteers in planning projects and citizen science. So all 100 of us, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Tia for joining us here this morning. And Tia, you can take it away. Thanks so much. Thank you, Robert. I'm glad to be here. Glad to get started. Well, I'll, I'll, I'm gonna share my screen and start the presentation. So give me a, a technical minute here. There we go. That sh everybody should now be seeing a living with wildlife intro uh, opening slide with some bears walking up the sidewalk. <clears throat> now, the one thing I will say, Seattle, Washington, these are the issues are are pretty much the same, probably, but the the wildlife may may not be the same because um, I'm not I'm not sure you you guys have some of the wildlife we're going to look at this morning. Um, so, as Robert said, if you've got questions. Um, put them in the Q&A and, and we'll, we'll deal with them when we get to the end. Um, that's the easiest way in a webinar mode with this many people and, um, and, and comments are always welcome. Um, so off we go, living with wildlife. So the thing about Massachusetts is Massachusetts is not a large place. It is a fairly small state. It's about 7,800 square miles. Before, before Europeans came in particular, um, it was a mostly forested, it, it, pre predominantly a, you know, a temperate deciduous forest biome here that we have interspersed with lots of freshwater wetlands. And then with, with uh, salt, saltwater wetlands, salt marshes, estuaries, beaches, et cetera, along, our, along the coastline. So those are our dominant, those are our predominant um, ecosystems or habitats. Um, and they pretty much covered the space. Um, and um, the indigenous peoples used it somewhat, but it wasn't until the Europeans came that, that we, we, trans, we, we translated those habitats into a very different dynamic. Um, a lot of the forest came down, pretty much all the forest by the early 1800s, or a lot of it. Um, and then it's, it's, it's since recovered somewhat in Massachusetts, but you can see we've got, we've got large urban areas We've got farming, we've got, you know, we've got all kinds, we've got fields where fields were not a common occurrence. Open grasslands were not a, a natural part of our habitat until humans came. I mean, until Europeans came. Um, so you, now, currently, Massachusetts is the third most densely populated state in the country. You might ask, what are the first two? I actually looked them up, New Jersey and Rhode Island, just to let you know. Um, and so that, you know, we've, we've completely cut up that early forest habitat into bits and pieces around the state. One of, one of the issues of, of uh, many of the environmental organizations in the state is trying to put together that, put back together that fragmentation, that patchwork of habitats, so that um, the organisms that live here have, have, um, have a larger space to work in, that habitat fragmentation is a huge factor in terms of human and wildlife interactions. Um, so there you go. So, you know, the thing is, is that, is that along with the humans, we have lots and lots of animals, some of which are quite well habituated or, 
or hang around humans a lot because a lot of them are, are edge habitat sort of organisms. They, they take advantage of that fragmentation um, in, in many ways to, to uh, expand their territories and their, and their numbers. Um, and so then what happens? How do we coexist with them? You know, a lot of people, they, they have two reactions to a, to a wild animal. Either it's just adorable and so cute, or it's a complete nuisance. And, and what we need to do is sort of shift our thinking. What it, what is, why is this animal here in my, in my space? Or am I, am I in their space? What's the space that we're sharing? And how can we, how can we coexist, you know, um, well, so that both, both I and the animal are, are, um, are able to, to live, our, live our best lives. And so that's, that's sort of where we're focused on today. Um, basic premise for, the, for the, our orientation, we will go through several different organisms, specifically a couple slides on each. Um, we won't get to everybody that, that somebody might consider a, an issue, um, but we'll get through a lot of them. Um, but this is, this is sort of the basic premise of how to avoid problems from the beginning. So you don't have a problem with, with an organism. And, and um, one of the biggest things is temptation. You know, don't, don't have food available to them. Um, don't offer them, you know, make sure that there's not, if you don't want them living under your house, then make sure your house is, is, is secured. Um, it is illegal to relocate a wild animal. You cannot trap them and move them. Um, if you have a, a nuisance wild animal, then you, you contact your, your town, um, contact your police department and ask them for, for the, uh, you know, for what to do. Um, you, you are not allowed to trap them and move them. Um, if, you, if you find injured wildlife, you can, you can look for licensed rehabilitators around the state and you can find that online. You probably could find that through your local police department. Um, I'm not sure. Who else would, I mean, we, we you know, if you call a, a Mass Audubon sanctuary near you, we usually keep a list of, of local rehabilitators. Um, and then if there's anything that happens that's of concern to you, call your, your local animal control officer, you know, call the police department, contact Mass Wildlife, you know, whatever it is, don't feel, don't worry about making contact with, with the officials in order to, to mollify your, your, your worries or take care of an issue. Um, so better to, to look to, to take care of the issue before it becomes more problematic. So there you go, that's, that's the premise and we'll, we'll go through the premise specifically for certain species here. Okay, Robert was saying that there's some, been some black bear seen in Tewksbury recently and I'm not surprised. Um, we have an, quite a significant population of black bears in Massachusetts and that population is expanding eastward. It's growing in numbers and it's moving eastward. So Tewksbury is, is you know, in, its, in the location. If you think sort of 495, they've really expanded well into the, um, up to the 495 um, highway and even inside of that quite significantly in certain towns. Um, they are very common in, you know, from 495 west um, is probably, you know, there are a lot of them. Um, I, my sister lives out in the western part of the state, and and she had to give up putting up bird feeders ages ago um, because of the bears. The thing about bears is they have an excellent memory. If they found food in a location once, they will come back to that location um, in another season. So you can't depend on them. If they they came and found your feeders, um, and we'll talk more about how to avoid conflict conflict with them, but but. They're, they have a very good memory. They also have a spectacular sense of smell. Um, so if there's something out there that they've smelled that's edible, they will track it down. Miles, apparently, they can smell something. They are crepuscular. We're gonna use a couple words here that I will define as we need to, um, but crepuscular means that the, the animal is active at dawn and dusk, basically, the edges of the day. And a crepuscular, a lot of animals are crepuscular. Um, it doesn't mean that you won't see them during the day, but their major times of activity are that dawn and dusk, and they tend to nap in the middle of the day and, and nap in the, in the night. They are omnivorous, it means they will eat anything, um, and they are very opportunistic. 
in terms of what kinds of food they can find and eat. And um, they are not true hibernators. They do not hibernate through the winter completely. They tend to sleep for long periods of time. We have animals that we sort of define as sleepers. They will sleep through a great portion of the, of the winter. So, so proportionately, they are asleep more than they're awake. Let's put it that way. Um, but they can, they can awaken and come out in the winter. Um, although it's, that's not, that's not the, the time of year that you need to, to be concerned about them in terms of their interactions with us. So here, this is a picture from Massachusetts. Um, this is a picture from our, our image library. And you can see this bear has completely destroyed this bird feeder. It's taken down the pole and ripped it to, you know, it's, it's ripped the feeder off. It's broken some other piece over here. I don't even know what that was, but there you go. So if, if you have bears, don't put out bird feeders. It just don't do it. It's not worth it. Um, especially if you see bears on a regular basis, don't put out a bird feeder. Um, if you have trash cans that are outdoors that are not contained in a, in a secure building, either a shed or the garage or something, if you have outdoor trash cans and you have bears, then you need to have trash cans that the bears can't open. I mean, they need to be metal, they need to have special, you know, they need to have tops on them that they can't get into. Um, plastic trash cans and plastic things, you know, any kind of plastic, um, they can probably rip their way into. Um, never feed your pets outside. That's just a bad, bad idea all the way around. Keep, keep your grill clean, keep your barbecue grill clean because that smell will, as I said, excellent sense of smell. They come, they come, they come, they come, they come. Um, and compost responsibly. And composting responsibly means, I mean, I'm off, I, I, I do think composting is, is a great thing for people to do um, with their, with their um, you know, organic material, but, but no dairy, no meat, no bones, because those are the kinds of things that, that they can smell and they will come and rip the compost open to eat those, where they won't go after um, composting vegetation for the most part, they'll leave it alone. Um, so that's, that's our, our, our preventing bear conflict, you know, bullet points. Um, if you've got bears, don't feed birds. That's the big one for most people. Um, okay, the other, the other major component uh, often of, of uh, conflict for people are, is our white-tailed deer. We have a huge white-tailed deer population in the state, um, mostly because they have no predators or their predator their predator, their major predator, the wolf, you know, the big, the, the wolves are gone. And so predation for them is not an issue. They may, they may lose a, a fawn here and there to the, to, uh, you know, the larger predators we do have. They may, you know, a sick, you know, injured adult will be taken, but, but there really is no predator around here for a, for a full, for a healthy adult white-tailed deer. Um, hunting, yeah, might be effective at controlling the population to a certain extent, and that's being used more and more across the state. Um, but in general, they, again, found everywhere throughout the state, um, crepuscular. The, the, interesting, um, the interesting thing here is that they do not have upper incisors. They do not have those front teeth. And so, when a deer has been chewing on your vegetation, it's pretty easy to pick out because it's very ragged. They use their tongue and their palate, their hard palate, to sort of rip the, their tongue and their bottom teeth and their hard palate, and they, they rip the vegetation off rather than chomp it. Um, so you can, you can usually pick out that you've got deer, deer brows um, around your yard and um, because of that raggedness. And, it's generally more of a problem in the winter when, when food sources are, are less, less prevalent. They are active all year, that's the thing. They need, a, they need food all year. Um, they also swim quite well. Um, they can swim to and from um, a fair distance. Uh, they've been seen swimming on the islands I know down south, uh, miles. So there you go. So that's our deer and to prevent deer conflict. Um, Scare tactics are probably the most useful um, in terms of some, but it can't be there consistently. If it's there, you know, like if you've got a, if you've got something like, if you've got mylar streamers that are just flicking around, they'll get used to it eventually. 
Um, and so if you can have something where, where it can be activated by them appearing, if there's a place, if there's a particular location where you're really trying to keep them out of, something that, that, that can essentially turn on and off um, is probably the most effective. Repellents do work with deer. Um, you can make your own smelly garlic, pepper, you know, rotten egg thing. You can use scented, people swear by Irish spring scented soap. I don't know, I've never tried it myself, but they, they, there are people who swear by it. You know, you just hang bars of Irish spring around, around your plantings. Deer resistant plantings are, are, you know, purported, but again, if the deer are hungry enough, they'll come and eat it. Um, so I'm not sure deer resistant plantings are the most effective thing. Fencing, if, you, if you're trying to fence, needs to be very high. Um, the literature says eight feet. I, that's probably okay as long as they can't get a, a you know long start. But even more effective than eight feet are a couple of fencings, one one like chest height and one higher, and no more than than um, you know two, three, four feet apart. So you could have a low fence, you know, about you know chest height to a deer, and then a higher fence behind that, if you really want to keep them out. The other thing is don't do not try to interact with them. One of the issues that happens all the time is people find a fawn resting and the, the doe leaves the fawn. The fawn is, is, a new fawn will not move, will stay there until the, the doe comes back and people find them abandoned, you know, and have to save them. Don't do it, let it be. The mother is nearby and she will return when you go away. Um, so do not save fawns. That's my, my, uh, my lesson for the morning, if nothing else. Now, I put this picture here. This is another picture from Massachusetts. And notice the state of these two animals. This is, this is a, a young buck and a doe, I believe. But look at, how, look at how emaciated they are, both of them. I'm not sure where this was in the state, but these are deer that are suffering from the fact that there are too many deer. Um, and so this is a problem for the state in general. And, and um, it's being dealt with by, by Mass Wildlife on, at various levels. Is Mass Wildlife is, is actively trying to determine the, the, uh, an accurate deer count around the state um, and, and figuring out um, measures to mitigate the issue. So wild canines. I put them together because they're both pretty similar. Um, our two major canines are Eastern Coyotes and Red Fox. We do have a Gray Fox, but Gray Fox are much more likely to be found on their own. They do not interact with our habitats anywhere near as much as the red fox does. Um, the way you, if you do have a fox and you're not sure, the way to tell the difference is, I'm not seeing it in this picture, maybe in the next slide, the red fox has a white tip to their tail and the gray fox does not. The gray fox tail is often fairly dark, has black stripe down it. Um, they both can be sort of red and gray. Um, so that's not a good way to, to differentiate them, but, but the red fox will always have a white tip on its tail. So again, very common throughout the state. They are both omnivorous. They are both crepuscular. They both use dens. They both have this regular patrolling um, behavior. Like, you know, the fox, the red fox in your area might come through your, your yard every Tuesday kind of thing. I mean, they're, they're quite specific usually. Um, it changes by season because it depends on, on food availability and things like that. Um, but they, they are out there all year and so they need food all year. And the one thing about the fox is that they're so cute, right? They're, so, they're kind of adorable. Here's a couple of, of young, you know, almost fully grown probably, but they're just adorable. They're sitting on the, on the edge of their den, it looks like with some, you know, there's some dirt mounds here. Even this, these are a couple of of almost adult, sub-adult uh, coyotes. And you can see they are big. They're very dog-like, the coyotes. People think our coyotes are, are part, uh, have, have hybridized with dogs. That is not true. What they probably did was hybridize with wolves on their way across the continent. And so our coyotes, the coyotes that have been tested, there was, some, there was a population in New York and a population on the Cape that were tested and they actually had wolf DNA in them. And so the presumption at this point is that our coyotes are, are bigger. They are bigger and rangier than the than Western coyotes. And that it's probably, they, they bred with the, um, with the red wolf on the way across the country um, as they expanded their territories. 
Now, to avoid confrontations with these guys, again, it's the same kind of thing. It's food availability. Don't feed the pet outside. Never feed the pet outside. I moved into a house. Oh, well, I'll say that story. Hold on. Um, if you have any kind of fruit production, like you've got apple trees or peach trees or any of that, you know, any kind of berries, if, if you've got a lot of fallen fruit, those are very attractive to both coyotes and foxes in, in that period of late summer, early fall. They'll, they'll eat a lot of fruit um, in their omnivorous behaviors. They, you know, they lean heavily to, to the carn carnivorous part when they're feeding their young and doing things like that. But then they will eat anything to get themselves bulked up for winter. Um, again, the trash cans, keep your pets indoors unless you are outside with them. Do not have free roaming pets. Coyotes will take cats. Um, coyotes will take small dogs. Red fox, probably not so much um, in terms of that, that issue, but, but a coyote will definitely take a wandering pet, um, especially if they're out, outside at nighttime. Um, you wanna make sure they can't get into the crawl spaces to den in them. Um, if you do, if you happen to keep chickens um, or you keep rabbits, you have to make sure that those pens are, are not accessible um, to them because a fox will definitely take a chicken um, or probably a rabbit and coyotes would do. You can see this, this coyote is, is walking, is, has got the head of a deer, um, which is it kind of, that's a dramatic photo. I love that photo. But here's a, here's a coyote, here's a red fox that has wormed its way under a fence. Um, so again, keeping them out is not an easy task if you have, if you have temptation inside. In, if there's temptation inside the fence and they get desperate enough, they will figure out how to get through the fence. Um, bird feeder areas, again, the seed that falls on your bird on the ground from your bird feeder, if you, if you see them out there, then you're gonna have to start cleaning it up. Um, so that's, that's our wild canines. Um, raccoons. Now raccoons were found, they are found everywhere on the state, in the state except Nantucket. Um, they, they had a, a population drop off um, significantly from being impacted by rabies, but they, are, they have made a comeback. So for a while we had very few raccoons and now we have more raccoons there. They are making a comeback. They are very clever, another term for highly adaptable. <laughs> Um, they are omnivorous and very opportunistic in terms of what they eat. Um, and when you look at the literature, the literature will say they nest in hollow trees. Well, yes, they nest in hollow trees, but they also will nest in a brush pile. They will nest in a culvert. They will nest in an old woodchuck den. They will nest in your barn. They will nest in your chimney. They will nest anywhere they can get into that keeps, you know, that offers them that kind of, of uh, safe space to, to uh, rear their young. They are crepuscular or nocturnal. Um, you know, they tend to, they tend to be in the darker parts of the day, the dawn to, you know, dawn to, to dusk, they are, they are not out and about a whole lot. However, this is something that people get very nervous about seeing these animals that are nocturnal or crepuscular animals during the day. With any of them, seeing the animal in the daytime does not indicate that they are sick. It just means they're out. They, especially in the when they're feeding their young, they're often out a lot more because they have to find the food sources. Um, and so just seeing an animal out and about does not mean it's sick. If the animal is out and about and, and behaving in a very, you know, whether they're aggressive or bizarre or walking in circles or, you know, doing something that indicates they're not, you know, they're not, okay, they're not okay, then contact your, contact your local um, animal control. Um, because that's, you know, it's good to, good to keep track of those things around, around, you know, when they're around you. They are active all year, although they do tend to, to bed down in the worst of winter, which is not necessarily a bad idea. If there's a big storm, you know, or, or a desperate, you know, a cold, cold spell, they'll, they'll stay in. They won't come, they, they'll stay in their dens. Um, and again, look at how cute they are, right? They're just adorable. So, and this is the thing, like if you look at this, this is kind of cute, like, you know, we came to the bird bath to get some water, but this is most people, so people probably might not object to the, to the raccoon on the left, but they probably would object to the raccoon on the right. 
and and um, you got to give this raccoon credit for getting into that bird feeder pan. That's that's impressive. Um, but again, trash cans they can't get into. No no pet food. You know compost. Make the compost so that it's not it it doesn't attract. It's not an attractant. Um, and this is this is probably important if they really are a problem in your in your buildings is is figuring out the access points and and, and closing them off. Um, because if they if they have come and nested in in one of your buildings, they will come back. Um, they, and they are, they can be very problematic once they get into a building. You, you'd have to call a a wildlife um, exterminator remover person. Um, you'd need some professional help with that probably. Okay, so that's our raccoons. Possums, another animal that people don't necessarily see a lot, but they are quite common and um, they are interesting. They are our only marsupial um, and they are, again, omnivorous. You're, you're, you'll notice a theme here for the animals that tend to be problematic for us. It's that, it's that theme of the fact that they eat the way we eat in many, in many ways. These, these guys are truly nocturnal um, you often see them in the road in the middle of the night. Um, they again are active all year. This is the northern, uh, Massachusetts is sort of the northern edge of their range. They tend to, to suffer from, from frostbite. Um, you'll often see them with raggedy ears or missing the end of their tail. The tail is prehensile, however, adults cannot hang from trees. The, the young can hang from the adult and possibly, you know, from a branch briefly, but but they don't hang from trees. Um, so that, you know, they're, people often see them and think they are a giant rat. It's, you know, they do have that look to them, but they are a marsupial and, and have, have a very interesting um, track pattern because they do, have, they do have an opposable thumb. Um, it's on their back foot, but they do have an opposable thumb, um, similar to ours. So again, you know, Again, impressive maneuvering for this opossum to get up onto this bird feeder. I'm, you know, that's that's really you got to give them credit for 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 their tenacity and their creativity. Now, however, I fault the bird feeder owner in this in this image. Hopefully, it's not the not the photographer. I don't know, but this is these are two hot dog rolls inside. What is what is meant to hold, um, you know, suet? It's a suet feeder, but what's inside that suet feeder are two hot dog rolls, and that's just that's we don't nobody needs to eat hot dog rolls. Certainly, we don't need to eat hot dog rolls, and we certainly don't need to feed it to our wildlife. Um, so, if you're going to put out food for wildlife, make sure it's food that's good for them, and that it's it's you know it's secured well um, and appropriate, and all those kinds of things. So, again, the same list. Keep, do not feed the pets outside. If you have external trash cans, make sure they can't be opened. And this is the hardest one for most people in bird feeders because it there's just bird seed just falls on the ground. If you if you if you um, I would recommend that you use something like a black oil sunflower seed or something like that rather than a commercial mix that you get like at the grocery store or the hardware store. If you're going to feed birds, then then don't invest in don't buy those mixes because a good part of the mix is, is seed that the birds don't actually eat. They don't want it. Um, and so they will throw it on the ground. Now, the opossum, the raccoon, the fox, you know, the bear, the turkeys, anybody will come. And there are others, there are, there are other wildlife that will come and eat that stuff off the ground. So you're better off to, to use things like black oil, sunflower feed, seed and suet feeders and, and, and thistle feeders, you know, have, have separate things. And, and, and don't, don't use those commercial mixes. Um, so that's our possum conflicts. And, oh, excuse me, moving right along here. What's, oh, another adorable and, and um, common, especially if you, if you um, live in, a, in an area where you've got some wooded, wooded habitat behind you or near you, and you've got some, some open fields, um, you will, Groundhogs, woodchucks, whistle pig, it's not a term I knew as a kid, but certainly groundhog and woodchuck are interchangeable. Um, these, these are a rodent and they are, uh, they, are, they are the diggers of the area. Virtually every den around, uh, every den in the ground was probably an old woodchuck den. 
an old woodchuck tunnel that, that somebody else, even if a coyote takes it over and enlarges it or a skunk or, a, or whoever, uh, you know, a fox, whatever. But in most cases, they were, they were dug by woodchucks in the first place. They are excellent diggers. I've heard that they can chew through rocks. I don't know if that's true. I have no verification on that. They are herbivorous, so they do hibernate through the winter. Um, however, they come out quite early. Um, the males, you may see them, you know, as early as late February around here. Um, and uh, once they come out, if you have a garden, they will, for the most part, if you have a garden and woodchucks, the woodchuck feels that you are growing that garden for them. I shouldn't say what they feel, that's a little anthropomorphic, but, but in general, if you have a garden and you have woodchucks near you, that will be problematic. And, and um, so they can climb a tree, but, but only if they're really challenged, they will go back into their den. They, they have these quite um, elaborate, long dens and they will almost always have two entrances. They'll have a main entrance and they'll, they'll have a back escape hatch um, to their, to their um, dens. They make spectacular dens, um, which is why other animals will often take them over. To avoid conflict with them, the biggest thing is that if you wanna keep them out of your garden is, is um, appropriate fencing. You have to dig down quite a ways and, and lay fencing underground. Um, above ground, they have found that, that uh, you know, hold the fence up with, with poles, but if the fencing is floppy, apparently, this, is, this was relatively new to me. It's not something I've, I've had any experience with, but that a floppy fence that they can't, you know, that they can't actually climb up, that they get stuck in sort of, or that, that you know, um, that is, is much more effective against, against these guys. Um, electric fencing is also, if, if you have a, you know, if you have a fence that you, you can um, put, a, put a, a charge and a battery, you know, a solar battery on, that works well. Um, you can see that one of the one of the issues outside of getting into your into your garden, um, another issue is they will they will sometimes really dig right under the foundation of your house if that if it's accessible if you know if you don't have a concrete wall there kind of thing, and that can be problematic. So you you need to make sure they can't get into those areas because once they start to dig, they're amazingly effective and very fast. Um, they're kind of, you know look at them they're kind of cute too. What can I say? Um, they do not care about repellents. There are people who talk about putting, you know, particular smells in their, in their den openings and they don't care. They'll just take them and throw them out. You know, you put it out like people soak rags in different things and put them in and it's supposed to discourage them. And, and I've seen them where they just take those rags and throw them back out. So um, I've never heard that repellents were successful. Um, okay, where are we? Uh, I'm just checking the time here. So, okay, we're still, we're, we're working our way through our mammals and then we'll, we'll hit um, some insects and some birds. Um, beaver, beaver were, um, are sort of an increase, again, an increasing population. So if you are, if you live in a space or you, or you, you are, if you are near a wetland, a freshwater wetland, um, this, the beaver are expanding their territories into places where they are, they, create issues because of that, that keystone species issue. They are um, an organism like humans that can alter their habitat. And they alter their habitat by building a dam so that the water then backs up and creates a, a, a marshy um, swampy area that allows them to more access to the foodstuffs they like, which they like the, what they eat is the inside of the bark of um, of trees, and they like particular species of trees. They like alders and willows and 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 um, black birch. I've I've noticed in places where I know beaver live that the black birch just they just chew them off instantly. Um, I don't blame them. I love that winter green myself, but but um, they are they are very effective um, at at uh, at altering their habitat. Um, they were eliminated from the state. Um, virtually eliminated and they have made a tr tremendous comeback um, and and they are protected again um, you can't you can't pack them up and move them um, but so uh, again crepuscular herbivorous all those things so if you have beaver and you are concerned about the beaver 
there are a few things you can do. One is if you have particular trees that you want to keep and you're noticing beaver activity, wrap your tree in, in um, you know, hardware cloth. Wrap, wrap the tree uh, several feet up in, in some kind of, of um, material. It has to, be, has to be metal. Can't use plastic fencing because they'll just chew through that um, to keep them from chewing down your tree. Control the water level in the, in the marshy area where they're coming from and living in. And, and that's usually done by installing some sort of system. They're called beaver deceivers and there are a bunch of different ones. Some of them are very effective, some not. Um, and what it does is it, it defeats the dam. They will, they, they are, they are into, um, they're oh, what's innate. They have an innate sense to stop the sound of running water. And so if, if you just make a, make a hole or if you just make a, you know, a ditch to take the water off, they will hear the water moving through the ditch and block the ditch. However, if you install a system whereby it goes underneath the dam or in a pipe or some other way so that they don't hear the water moving and the water is moving in a, in a way that they can't stop it, they, then you can get around, you can, you can control their, their, their water level. Um, best to not necessarily remove them, you know, remove the dam completely because they'll just build a new one in that place. The um, town DPWs often have big issues because the DPW just keeps taking the dam out and then the beaver just builds it again. And then they want to kill the beaver. So figuring out how to, how to alleviate the conflict without killing the wildlife is, is um, certainly, you know, it's a, it's a better better concept um, because if, you, if you've got a place where the beaver are and you kill those beaver, some other beaver will come. You know, you, you've, not, you've got to eliminate the problem that, that is drawing them. Okay, so mice, lots of mice. You know, depending on your building, um, depending on what house you live in, depending on where you are, you, you almost all of us end up with, with mice at some point. Um, I was sitting on my couch. When was it? Well, in the spring. I was sitting on my couch in the evening. I was being very quiet. I was reading. And all of a sudden, this mouse just came right up and looked at me on the arm of the, of the couch. And I was like, where did you come from? And it ran away. Um, but it was pretty funny. It didn't, it, it obviously had no idea I was still sitting there. Um, but at any rate, a lot of them are not mice. They're meadow voles. But that's a, you know, that's a moot point in terms of taxonomy. They all look like mice to us, you know. So the meadow vole, the house mouse or the lab mouse, or the, this is a mouse that, that is ubiquitous at this point, um, though not native to us. And then the white-footed mouse. There's a deer mouse looks so much like the white-footed mouse, you can't really tell them apart. Um, but this is, these, these two are native and this one's introduced. Um, the, the, the house mouse, sorry, I'm using my, my cursor, which I'm not sure everybody can see. The house mouse is the one in the middle on the right, and the top is the meadow vole and the bottom is the white-footed mouse. Um, and the biggest issue with these guys is, is their rate of reproduction. Remember, this is um, the, all of these are major prey sources for any of our, of our um, you know, omnivorous carnivore type species or, or our birds of prey. Um, you know, so from a red-tailed hawk to a, to a red fox, to a, you know, to a skunk even, they'll, they'll eat baby mice. Um, and so that reproduction rate is what allows them to survive when, when they are, you know, the sort of bottom level of the food chain kind of, kind of animal. Everybody eats a mouse pretty much. Um, and so if you, again, you know, they can be active any time of the day, but they are mostly nocturnal. Um, they don't, they tend to avoid humans, but they certainly like our, our, our habitations. Um, so sealing your house perimeter is a very difficult task, um, but it can be done if you've, got, if you've got holes around pipes that go in and out of your, your foundation, things like that. Those are areas where, where um, you know, you can get holes are, are, you know, they can get through a space that you wouldn't think they could get through. Um, one thing that's usually fairly effective to stuff into a, if you have got a conduit and, and something small, you, Fill it with uh, steel wool because they, they can't get through, they can't chew up the steel wool. 
Um, make sure you don't have open food containers. Um, make sure you have containers that mice can't get into. If you're storing, you know, bird seed or something like that, um, make sure that, you know, mice and squirrels and stuff can't chew their way into the bird seed. Balsam scent apparently works. I've never tried that. I've read that a number of times. You can also, um, you know, I mean, your basic mouse trap is, was invented for a reason. It, it works. Um, peanut butter happens to be peanut butter or a peanut butter cookie um, works, works really well um, to, to draw them to a trap if you are willing to trap them. Um, and I would only do that if they are a nuisance inside the house. Um, but you can see here's a, here's a mouse that set up a set, is trying to set up a shelter inside a, a bird a birdhouse, um, one of our birdhouses. So there you go. They are they are extremely agile and able to get through openings that you wouldn't even think of. So sealing the house is, yeah, you know, preventing removing temptation is probably um, more effective than sealing the house because just because of how much you know how much sealing you'd have to do. All right, so that's the that's the end of our of our of the uh, mammals for to, for this presentation, and we're going to move on to to uh, bees and wasps because this is this is one of my my um, my issues of of how people approach the world, which is that insects are very useful organisms. Without insects, we would not exist. And one of the big things for most people is that insects are there. They're not necessarily comfortable with insects and they're particularly not comfortable with insects that might sting them. We have hundreds of species of local of native bees. Um, and in general, native bees are very disinclined. They are not aggressive. They, they, most of them are solitary. They do not have a hive to defend. And so they, they rarely, if ever, sting people unless you happen to just pick them up and tromp on them, um, kind of thing. And uh, they are extremely important in for many reasons. One is pollination; the other is is pest control issues. Um, but for for our native bees, most of them are important pollinators for our for both for our native systems and for our agricultural systems. They need they're one of the problems for native bees is loss of habitat. And I, if I can encourage anybody here today to think about leaving the leaves, do not rake up every single leaf that falls in your yard, especially under the shrubbery, maybe around the edges, let it be messy. Leave, leave, leave that leaf litter there because there's probably nothing you could do that's more beneficial to our native insects than to leave those leaves. Um, you can plant all the, all the, you know, the pollinator friendly flowers you want. But more important than that at this point is, is to give them habitat. Um, and that, and for, for many of them, they need that kind of untended area um, on the edges um, that's, that's just vastly important. Then we move on to the more predatory um, wasps and hornets. These, again, they're very important for pest control. They are parasitoids and parasitic, and they, they control the populations of, of insects that are not beneficial um, and you know so they are useful this is a this is a, a bald-faced hornet which is the ones who make those big the the, the big beautiful nests that, that that are all chewed up bits of wood and and sort of conical um, those are not paper wasps those are bald-faced hornets make those um, they are a native species we have other we have other wasps the the ichneumons and the and the other wasps that are that are not in that Hornet category that that um, that are truly not dangerous. They are not aggressive, and they they are highly beneficial. The hornets, the introduced hornets in particular, can be problematic. But again, if you leave them alone, they'll leave you alone. Um, so I highly recommend that unless they are in your doorway, and you know the the um, the paper wasps with their with their little you know sort of upside down mushroom looking looking uh, hives with the open cells at the bottom, the, the yellow jackets that tend, they, they introduce, you know, the yellow jackets that tend to nest in the ground. Um, if, if they're not in your way, leave them be because they are part of the ecosystem that, that is highly important. 
bumblebees are hugely important. I love bumblebees, um, but but any of these any of these are the the issue is the end of the season for hornets, um, where they don't have as much to do. They're not taking care of the young larvae anymore because the queen has stopped laying because the 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 uh, the colony is gonna is going to die over the winter. The only person, the only, the only person, the only one that will survive the winter are the young, are the queens that were laid, you know, late in the summer. They'll they'll mate and survive and start a new colony in the in the spring. And so fall can be an issue. Um, and what you want to do is make sure that that you set yourself up so that again, remove the temptation. Um, don't leave out trash. If you again, if you've got fruit, don't let the fruit rot on the ground because there is nothing more attractive to a hornet than a rotten apple um, on the ground. Um, if you're worried about yourself, try not to wear scent when you're outside because they come to check out the scent. They are they are they definitely function in a in, tra in tracking down scents to see if there's an if there's an edible factor behind the scent, um, and um, this is this is a you know a noble effort, but it's you know a, presumably in a place where you've been doing your your mowing, they're not going to be an issue. Around the edges, you might find them. Um, if you see a bee swarm, that is not dangerous. Bees swarming are that that is a honeybee. Honeybees are not native, but at any rate, there are lots of them around. And so if you see a honeybee swarm, they are not dangerous. They are totally focused on finding a new place to live. And you could walk right up and put them on your I've watched the beekeeper just collect them and they, you know, he gets the queen down and he puts them all in a bucket um, and they pay no attention to him. This is, this is the classic bald-faced hornet nest um, with the opening here. Um, and so just, just be aware of learning about them and preventing conflict by, by again, avoiding the attractants. Um, this is actually up over a door of one of our buildings and the, but there's a roof the door is under is underneath this secondary roof line here in the picture, and so I convinced our our property staff like, oh, we got to take that down. That's dangerous. I'm like, it's like 20 feet in the air, and it, there's a there's a, another roof line between them and the people that are going in and out of the building. They and nobody they didn't bother anybody. Absolutely nobody got stung. So there you go. Um, now the the other um, the other thing in terms it's not an insect, but it's but it's in that invertebrate category that, that Robert mentioned, which I don't have a slide about are ticks. And I don't have a slide about ticks because ticks are ubiquitous. They are everywhere. Um, to avoid tick issues, do tick checks. When you're out with your dog, tick check your dog, tick, tick check yourself. Um, there's really not a lot you can do in terms of preventing ticks. If you live in an area where there are deer and, and mice, there will be ticks. Um, and so in terms of ticks, I would just say, you know, there, you can, if you've got a forested area between you and your yard, if you feel like there is a lot, there are a lot of ticks in that forested areas, you can put in a, a you know, you can create a barrier, essentially an unvegetated barrier of, of gravel that needs to be six to eight feet wide. That, that supposedly is effective at keeping ticks back, you know, back in the wilder area and keeping them out of your yard. I'm, I'm not sure if that's true, but that is that is the recommendation if you want to, if you're trying to control them. There you go. Um, but insects in general, remember the vast majority of insects, even um, invertebrates in general, are beneficial. Don't kill them. Try try to avoid, you know, knee jerk reactions to to uh, stomp on the on the ants or the whatever it is. Um, ah, birds. Okay, They're, most people like birds. They feed them to get them to come to their their yards often. Um, but they they can be problematic. We can have interactions that are that that we consider problematic. Um, and one of and the group that that pops up first for many people are woodpeckers pecking on their house. Um, so we have we have these four species of woodpeckers. These are our are common woodpeckers around New England um, in general. There are a couple others, not so common, but but um, but these these two smaller guys in particular, this this the downy woodpecker, the most common um, woodpecker we have. 
and probably the, the, the most, the one that you're likely to see pecking around on your house. So woodpeckers drill on wood for a number of reasons. One is to create a cavity um, to nest in. The other is to find food. And the other is to communicate, is to make noise, is the sound of the drumming. Is it, so there's drumming, there's, net, there's cavity building, and there's feeding. Um, and all of those are, are important aspects of their life cycle. Um, and what happens for many of us, including my house, is that in the, in the, late, in the late summer, fall season, when the, the, the young juveniles are out and about, I'll get them drilling on my house. I'll get them, they'll come over and they'll, and they're, that's just like, they're not looking for bugs. It does not mean there are bugs under your claps or your shingles or whatever. Um, it just means that they're drilling. They, they, it has nothing, don't, don't let anybody convince you. It means that your house is infested. It means that you've got a house that, that they view as a good place to drill. Um, so it, it's not about the quality of your, of your, of your wood. Um, Pileateds make huge cavities, numerous huge cavities. And that's because in, they're, they're looking in rotten wood for, for uh, carpenter ants. Carpenter ants um, will tunnel in, in, in uh, wet, in damp wood, um, damp decomposing wood. And so, uh, and that's, that's, their, that's a primary food source for a pileated woodpecker. Um, now to avoid conflict, preventing woodpecker conflicts, um, the, generally it's temporary. Like my house, I've never, I've never really worried about it. They come, they go a couple times, you know, they've, somebody's actually drilled its way through one of my shingles. So I refer a place a shingle, but, but that's about it. But if it is, if it is consistent and it gets worse and they keep coming back, then mylar streamers are very effective. Something that moves that they don't, you know, that, that, that will keep them you know, if you can hang mylar streamers down over the pride, if here's the problem area and you've got mylar streamers in front of it, that that's probably the most effective way to keep them off your house. Um, I've known people who've, who've put up helium balloons with streamers hanging down because they can't actually, so they anchor the balloon lower on the ground or on the, you know, on the base of the house and it, and the balloon and the streamers stay up in the area where the, where the, um, the woodpeckers tend to, to work. And again, that's a temporary issue because it's, I, I, it's a temporary solution to what is usually a temporary issue um, that they don't, they don't come. Um, they don't do that drumming year round on your house. Um, you can string up bird netting. And if you, have, if you have dead trees and snags and you have the space, leave some standing because they'll use those. They'll drum on those. I lived in a house one time that was on a street, on a corner and um, the woodpecker, a couple different springs. I bet it was the same bird. He, he came back and he, he used the stop sign at the corner um, and he would drum on that stop sign because it made a go, it was really loud. You know, it was a great noise. So, you know, it was, it was a perfect, perfect uh, advertisement for him. Um, but so if they've got places to drum, they've got places to find food, they'll, they'll be less inclined to use your house. Um, another bird that people have conflicts with, this is a great story. Um, the wild turkeys, which were reintroduced into the state in the 1970s, they were, they were gone, they were completely extirpated, which means they no longer lived in Massachusetts in um, like the 1850s. Um, and then in the, in the 1970s, um, fisheries and wildlife started reintroducing them into the western part of the state and have since relocated that that was so successful they brought in like 60 turkeys or so from New York and Pennsylvania and those turkeys were so successful that they have they translocated some of those birds across the state to maybe as far east as Grafton I believe was the last place and the rest of it the turkeys have done themselves which is amazing they now live in I mean you can find turkeys in Boston um, so they are, they are very prevalent. They, um, when they're displaying, they can be pretty intimidating. However, just remember it's a hierarchy for a turkey. It's not territoriality. They are not defending a space. They are defending their position in the flock. 
And if you can be a bigger turkey, they are they will they will back off. You don't want to hit them, but if you ca carry a broom or go out with a broom or some some object, you know, or a couple, you know, carry things out with you that make you look big and fierce, um, and wave them around, and and they will often back off. Um, you just you you know if you, if you if you turn and run, they, they'll probably you know he might he might decide you're you're worth chasing. So try not to turn and run. Um, even though for a, for a small human, a turkey, a, a, you know, a male turkey displaying can be very intimidating. Um, but they're beautiful birds, they're fascinating. Um, and, uh, you know, if they're around you, try not to feed them. Um, it's not, I, you know, outside of bird feeding, you know, um, the songbirds, I discourage putting, you know, a lot of food on the ground for you. You, you don't want to feed the deer um, because you're feeding them things that, that are probably not beneficial to their digestive system. And if you start feeding the turkeys, they'll just they'll just come and inundate your space. Um, so that's that's my that's my two cents on feeding turkeys. I'm sorry, we've, we've, we're running out of time here. Well, piping plovers in general, we, this is an issue for people who live on the coast. Um, and we have to protect the beaches. So these, uh, now this is an adorable little creature. The plover has to have a place to, to nest and reproduce and, and grow into a, and fledge into an adult successfully. And that's why we have, you know, off limit spaces uh, along our beaches because we are, a, we are an important breeding area for, for piping plovers. Um, and that's, People complain about it, um, that they wanna be able to use the beach and, and drive vehicles across the beach. And, um, you know, it's just, we need to put up with, with some inconvenience in order to, to allow this population, this, this species to survive. So that's my two cents on piping plovers. And if you go to the beach early in the, early in the uh, season, you'll see these adorable little, they are just the cutest little things ever. There you go. Um, so, you know, respect, respect for the wildlife, keep them wild. Do not try to approach them. Do not try to make them into a pet um, by means of feeding them or interacting with them in a way that, that is appealing to you, but probably not good for them. Um, because, you know, wild animals that do not fear people are, are they'll, they'll be dangerous to us and it's a danger to them because in general, they'll end up having to be um, removed because they, they've lost their relationship with their ecosystem and their, and their, their own population. And, and for most people, they can't put up with it. Most humans can't put up with an, an, a wild animal that, that is not wild. Um, and so if you, if you do that, if you interact with them in that way, and get them to think that people are okay, then mostly what you're doing is, is they'll, be, they'll have to be removed. Keep yourself safe, um, you know, Always, always think of your safety. If you've got an animal that you cannot interact with on a, on a, you know, a wildlife to human level that's that works for both of you, then that animal probably does need to be relocated or removed by a professional, not by you. But Wild Massachusetts um, is part of the Fisheries and Wildlife, you know, Mass.gov. Um, that's a great resource, so I highly recommend that. And that is our last slide. And I apologize for running to the full extent of our of our hour. I'm happy to stay for for uh, 10 or 15 minutes if people want want to do questions. I think that's great, Tia. I appreciate your uh, flexibility and willingness to um, go a little bit here into overtime. Um, all right, so we do have uh, about 15 questions <laughs> already. Uh, folks, keep getting them in. I'll do my best. Um, Pina says, how can I deter raccoons from eating tomatoes in my garden? <laughs> oh, that is a good one. You know, that's, that's because they've found your garden. They're very clever. They can climb anything. I don't know that you can, to tell you the truth. Um, you, could, you could try sort of netting them, like bird netting, um, but whether they would, they would, they would allow that, that, that's one of those moments where you may have to, you may have to give up tomatoes for a few years you know, not, not produce tomatoes, um, not grow tomatoes until they, they, until the local raccoons move on. 
I'm I I apologize, but I've got nothing more <laughs> nothing more to offer against a, a raccoon that's found your tomatoes. Yeah. Uh, great question from Beth. Uh, how has the drought affected wild wildlife and their interactions with people? That's a that is a good question, and and the the basic premise. I mean, the basic answer is that that um, our wetlands have shrunk, and so it we have. We have this. So water source is, is a huge issue for, for many of these organisms, finding a source of water um, and, and finding a food source. Um, if, a, if, if they've got a food source that they used that is, that is not producing this year because it's too dried up, then they are going to, they're going to expand their, their, their forays into areas that probably will bring them in, in contact with us more frequently. Uh, let's see here. So many questions. Uh, so many good ones. Uh, this may be similar to the first question, but I'll ask it anyway. Sandra says groundhogs are a terrible problem for my vegetable garden. They are denning in my neighbor's backyard, which is not mown, uh, mowed. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Is there yeah. anything that works to deter them? No, um, that, that's the thing. Yeah, your, your neighbor's unmowed backyard sounds like perfect habitat for uh for the for the woodchucks and your garden is is a perfect food source so it all works for them you know and and the thing i mean the only people i've known who've been successful at keeping them out of the garden have done the dig dig down at least a foot and often dig straight down and then have an l and this is hard fencing have an l that comes out another you know 10 to 12 inches so you dig a trench and lay in a an l worth of 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 uh, fencing that comes up above the ground. And then you can try the, the floppy fencing above ground, but there, there are no repellents that seem to make any difference to woodchucks. Uh, Linda says, I hit a deer with my car and I know mm -hmm. others who have hit deer. Mm -hmm. Do you have any advice for safe driving to avoid this? No, because they're, they're, they are so common. This is, this is a huge issue. And at, at times it leads to, uh, leads to problems both for the human and the deer. Usually the deer is, has to be, if it's not dead, it needs to be euthanized, but the human often, often can have major consequences as well. And they're really, I mean, use your highlights as much as you can at night. I would recommend, especially if you're on roads that are, that are back roads and things like that, that are not, not necessarily lit, but, but even in places where you know where you're going and you don't feel like you need the high beams, use your high beams. It will help you see farther ahead and, and ideally it, they will see you um, and, and then you can avoid the conflict because it's just a timing issue for most of us in terms of we don't know where they are and they pop out and then we hit them. Um, but yeah, so I think my, my, best, my best recommendation is use your high beams whenever you can. Uh, my old pal, Cindy Grove, who I'm looking forward to seeing virtually uh, next month, she asks, uh, we often see fox uh, that look like they are losing fur, especially on their tails. Is this natural or are they sick? Uh, it can be either. It's, it's too, too difficult to call from, from that perspective in terms of just saying yes or no, you know, yay or nay. They, um, fox are prone to mange, which is a condition that, that makes their fur fall off fall out, they could, you know, they, they could be in the midst of molting because they do molt one, one pelage, one, one fur layer for another, you know, different times of the year. Um, so it could be natural and it, it could indicate mange, which would be the major, major problem for them. Diane asks, how is the bat population in Massachusetts, are they becoming endangered here? Um, there is one bat species in particular, the small brown bat, which was very common and is now endangered. They have succumbed to white nose syndrome, which is a fungus that, that got into their, their, their areas where they, they den in winter. Um, other bat species are not as severely impacted and are actually, you know, they're, they're holding their own. And so they, they will probably become more um, like the big brown bat and the the red bat, I the eastern red bat, those bats um, are still around, but the small, the small brown bat is virtually is 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 now listed as endangered in the state. Good question. Uh, Joyce says, I live near a park and reservoir, and they have very many geese. Can anything 
can anything be done about them? They are taking over the space. Yeah. <clears throat> the, the only thing, yeah, geese are hard. Um, and, and the only thing that works probably is to try to fence them out um, so that they don't get into the lawn or the grassy areas um, to start with. And that's, pro that's not practical in most parks. Um, when they nest, when geese nest, they molt their flight feathers so they can't fly. Um, so what they are looking for is access that allows them to walk up onto the walk up onto a grassy place where they can eat and have a nest, and then walk back into the water. Um, and so if that can be prohibited, um, then you you can probably keep the geese out of a space. But that's it's likely not practical for a for a reservoir or a park. Noise supposedly works. Uh, Kimberly asks, do you have any advice for flying squirrels? They <laughs> frequently uh, find their way into our attic each fall. We have yeah. trimmed tree branches near the house, which helps a little. Yeah. So what I would do there is, is um, check any openings through your roof. Check your, the flashing around your chimneys or anything around your, um, you know, your, the, the pipe from the, you know, the toilet air Thing, pipe. I so sorry, just completely forgot the terminology there. But any anything that goes through your roof or around the edges of your of your soffits, make just that's what you want to seal up um, because they're they're getting onto your roof and then from the roof they're getting into the house. And so look, have somebody come and and really just survey all around your roof line. Um, and the most common, I would say, is is loose flashing around the chimney. Uh, Jennifer asks, are, uh, is there any way to discourage chipmunks from making holes in my stone calf? They are making a mess. <laughs> You've given them a perfect place to dig, I think is what they feel. And so, uh, I, you know, that's a great question. No, outside of reducing the population of your chipmunks, I don't, you know, if, if you've got a, if you've got a stone, you could try using um, material that is, that is denser or more packed, compacted use, um, but I've seen them dig through pack that's a product of, you know, stone dust and very small gravel, which supposedly they don't dig through, but I've seen chipmunk holes in it. And so unfortunately on that one, I got nothing to offer. You could try putting um, a rock over the hole they've dug and see if you can discourage them. To be a little more aggressive, you could, you could run a hose into that hole and drive them out of that, that tunnel. Um, and if you if you disturb them enough, they may they may decide to move on. Uh, an anonymous attendee asks, can woodpeckers actually cause trees to fall over? No. Uh, well, no. I mean, because woodpeckers are are pecking on a dead tree that you know, eventually that tree will fall over. A lot of uh, I mean, I've I've seen, you know, where a tree obviously had had significant carpenter ants, and so the 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 pileated and the others were were working up and down the tree, and so yes, they probably structurally weaken it, but that's part of the natural that's the natural process of that tree, you know, decomposing and going back into you know, recycling those nutrients that are in that tree. Um, so if you if it's if it's in a place where it might fall on something, if that's the fear, then then I would take it down, but leave ten or twelve feet. So that they can utilize it, but take down the top. Um, but they will only they only work on a dead tree. Um, so a dead tree is going to fall over eventually anyway. So combination. All right, we've got a few more uh, minutes and a lot of questions. I'm going to combine three questions here, TS. So just wait for me to finish, okay? Okay. Uh, an anonymous attendee asks: Do wasps or hornets ever build nests in the ground? And then Sandra asks. We have an underground nest of hornets or wasps that we can't seem to get rid of, even with repeated spraying. Do you mm -hmm. have any suggestions? And then Samantha asks, how do you get rid of wasps and bees in your backyard without getting stung? <laughs> okay, so there's several, there's several points to, to address here. Um, so the uh, yellow jackets, terrestrial yellow jackets or underground yellow jackets that we have natives and we have introduced yellow jackets that both nest in the ground. And they are problematic because you don't know where they are. You have to watch for the entrance of that, of that, of that hole. 
um, and it's very difficult to uh, control them. Sprays generally won't reach the entire population if you try to spray into the hole. Um, I would say, you know, flag it so that you know it's there. Really put, put like a little landscape flag or something near it so you know where it is and then address it in the winter time and fill it. Um, you know, I'm not sure what would happen if you tried to fill it during the season, if you tried to get in there and, you know, at night. The one thing, if you are trying to remove a hornet nest that's problematic is, is to do it at night, to do it after sunset, when everybody has returned into the nest and, and then you can spray them, then you can spray them. That's the most effective time to spray. You use a mint spray. So it's it's not it's not toxic to to uh, other species and it doesn't doesn't remain to be an issue. And so for the person asking about not getting stung, a you don't want to remove bees. Bees are always beneficial. If you have a problematic hornet nest, then yes, I can see removing that. But and the thing to do is to wait until everybody has returned in the evening, and then use a mint spray, um, specially indicated for hornets, um, and use the mint spray on it. The person with the, the problem in the ground, that is a tough one. Um, and, and so are, you may be stuck with that nest for this season. And what I would recommend is making sure you know where it is so that once we've had hard frost and that nest is, is dead for the season, you know, well into the winter and then go out and deal with it. Um, you know, reconstruct that area so they won't come back to it. Uh, and uh, last question, we'll go to Karen. Um... She says, this has been great information, but I'm also interested in finding out more about, about wildlife rehabbers uh, near me in Tingsboro. Uh, it seems like they get stressed out and they can't do it for long. And they're also yeah. frequently underfunded. So do you just want to talk briefly uh, overall about uh, wildlife, wildlife rehabbers? And is there any sort of online resources, like a, a large list of them in Massachusetts anywhere? You know, it, that is a, a really... Um... That's a great question. I think it's very stressful to be a wildlife rehabber. Different wildlife need have different um, needs. Um, so there, there are people who do better, I think, are the people who specialize in particular types, like they rehab owls or they rehab, you know, uh, 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 mammals or whatever. Um, and uh, I'm not sure if there is a single list. There are, there are places where you can go. You can go to Mass Wildlife. Um, that's a resource that I believe they keep a rehabbers list there. Um, the Tufts Veterinary Clinic is another place that might have uh, a rehab list. Um, try your, your local, uh, if you've got a, a local, I know um, Mass Audubon sanctuaries generally keep a, keep a list of people, of rehabbers near them. Um, but as you say, they tend to come and go because it's, it's not an easy thing to do. Um, it would be great to have some sort of, you know, funding for rehabbers that, that they could have access to. That's a great idea. I don't know how you'd get about it, but that's a, that's a good idea because it's expensive and, and difficult work. And Tia, I'm going to take 60 seconds and make you blush here. Uh, Alicia says, an amazing hour. Thank you so much for your presentation. Pilar says, this was excellent. Thanks so much. Bernadette says, so informative. Cynthia says, very interesting presentation, an hour well spent. Samantha says, thank you so much, with about 10 O's. Uh, Gail says, helpful and entertaining. Uh, Marianne says, you have a fantastic quilt in the background. Um, and she also thought your presentation was fantastic. Uh, Barbara says, this was had lots of interesting and helpful information. Uh, Wendy called it an excellent program. Durrett, uh, very informative. Sandra, a lot of good information. Cindy said it was wonderful. Michelle says, thank you for putting it on and being so informative. Uh, Nancy shared a resource, uh, livingwithwildlife.org. Joyce says, excellent presentation. Kimberly says, great program. Debbie and Dina loved your presentation as well. So uh, Tia, any uh, last words before we wrap it up? No, I just, I, I, I appreciate everybody being here and, and, and taking the time to, to spend this hour to learn more about what, what's all around them so that you can, you can interact with them. Um, oh, somebody's posted, mass.gov wildlife rehabilitation. Good for you. Um, so that you can learn about what's around you and how to interact the most successfully with them. Um, there you go. 
Great. Well, uh, folks, look for that email tomorrow, feedback survey, recording, um, and uh, hopefully some information about some other uh, programs we're doing with the Mass Audubon uh, this fall. If I don't have that information in the email tomorrow, I'll send out an email uh, next week. So thank you all so much, and I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their day. Thanks again, Tia. Thank you. Bye-bye.